you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews, the second chapter. We're going to read a couple of passages of Scripture. Hebrews, the second chapter, the first verse says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. In other words, the writer of Hebrews was saying, you need to give very close attention to the things that you've heard. Because if you don't, there's going to be a time that you'll let them slip away. In Judges, the second chapter, the eighth verse, it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Tim the Nathares, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of Gash. And also all that generation was gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Remember the writer in Hebrews says, if you don't pay attention to what you've heard, you'll let them slip. In the book of Judges it says that there arose another generation which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done. Matthew chapter number 11, verse number 12, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And Jude, the only chapter there is in Jude, verse number 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful, me, needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Hebrews said if you don't pay attention, there's some things you'll let slip. The book of Judges, we see that because somebody didn't pay attention somewhere, that just 20 years later, just 20 years later, the Bible says that there arose a generation that knew not the Lord, nor the works which he had done for Israel. Matthew said, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And in the book of Jude, he said, You need to earnestly contend or fight for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Holy God, I'm asking you this morning, Lord, you'd help us today. Because, Lord, when you return, and when we began to be weighed in the balances, God, I don't want to have anything less than what the elders delivered to us. I'm asking you this morning, Lord, that you would open our minds, our hearts, and our spirits. I pray that you would put within each and every one of us beginning right here. In this pulpit, a passion for the things of God like never before. A spirit about us that refuses to turn loose of any part of our inheritance, oh God. But there would be a burning desire and passion to be everything that you've ordained for us to be. And even more, God. Help us today to be just that. We're going to be careful to give you praise. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're going to help me preach, you can be seated. I want to preach to you this morning on this subject. Contenders. Contenders. There are just some things that are exclusively apostolic. There are identifying marks that have been handed down to us by the elders. That if we don't earnestly contend for them and fight for them. There are things that have been identifying marks of the apostolic faith for generation after generation that if we are not very careful in this generation 
And we do not fight for those things and contend for those things and keep those things before us and add our attention. Then if we're not careful, there's going to arise a generation should the Lord tarry long enough. There will arise a generation after us that will be just like the generation in the book of Judges. They won't have the identifying marks of the apostolic church. They won't have the move of the spirit that we've been so blessed to be a part of. They won't have the signs and the wonders and the miracles that we've been pleasured to be a part of. But what will happen is there will be a generation that will arise after us that will be just another religious denomination, another used to be. But I've come to tell you this morning that you have a pastor in this pulpit that made up his mind a long time ago. I'm going to fight for the faith that's been delivered for me. I'm not going to stand beside my elders on on judgment day and possess anything less than what they handed for me but I made up in my mind that when I get ready to leave this world that I put some kind of mark on the generation after me that when they look at me I don't want them to see anything less than what they saw in the elders that were before me I don't want to lose one thing that the elders handed down to me I want to make sure that when I walk through this world they understand without a shadow of a doubt that man's not just a a preacher but he's an apostolic preacher he's a one God Jesus name baptizing I believe in repentance I believe in baptism in Jesus name I believe in the necessity of the Holy Ghost I'm not backing up I'm not watering it down I'm not sugarcoating it I'm fighting for the faith Unfortunately, there are those that are standing in pulpits this morning that call themselves apostolic that are not completely convinced that if it matters whether or not you believe there's just one God or there are three, does it really matter if you're baptized in Jesus' name or if you're baptized in the titles? But I'm here to tell you, I'm not backing up. Except the man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And when you go to that water, there's only one saving name and that's the name of Jesus it's not a matter of somatics it's a matter of salvation hallelujah I believe that I'm a part of a church this morning of people that have come that believes that we're going to contend for the faith. We're not backing up. We're not backing down. But I'm telling you this morning, if we don't fight for this, if we become passive and casual about it, if we become ho-hum about it, well, I don't know if it really, it does matter this morning. And if you don't fight for it, if you don't stand for it, you'll lose it. You'll lose it. It grieves me every time I read Judges, the second chapter. It grieves me because the Bible says there arose a generation that knew not the Lord. In a 20 year span of time, there arose a generation that knew not the Lord nor the works that He had done for Israel and Egypt. Brother Hancock, you know what that is? That's an indictment against the elders. They missed it somewhere. They failed to pass it down somewhere. You see, there, there's always, if you're not careful, there's this progression. There's a generation that grabs a hold of truth uh, and they get a revelation of truth uh, and they're passionate about it and it burns in them. And then there's another generation that didn't have to fight for that revelation as much as that first generation. It's handed to them on a silver platter. And so they have truth, but they don't have a passion and a love for truth like that first generation because it really didn't cost them anything. That's what the Lord was warning them of in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, beware when you live in houses that you didn't build. Uh, and when you drink from wells that you didn't dig and you eat from vineyards that you didn't have to plant, beware lest you forget the Lord. You see, that's what happens when we're handed something that don't cost us anything and we're privileged and we're blessed if we're not careful. We'll forget where those blessings come from and that's what happens to a next generation of apostolics. You see, I'm first generation apostolic. I wasn't raised in this. I came into this. I was born into it. I had to fight for the 
revelation of truth that I got. I had to get my Bible out and read it for myself. I had to pray for myself. I had to get it for myself. But if you're not careful, there's another generation that will come behind you. Your children. My children didn't have to fight for the revelation of the oneness of God because it's when they were little enough to understand, I began to teach them Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I began to teach them Acts 2.38 every night when they went to bed. I began to teach them Ephesians 4 and 5. They didn't have to work for it. I planted it in them. I gave it to them. And because it didn't cost them anything, they may not love it just quite as much as me. You see, there arose a generation that wasn't in Egypt. They didn't know anything about Egypt. They didn't know anything about 400 years of bondage. They didn't know anything about whips being on their back and making brick in the heat of the sun. The generation that came out of Egypt, somehow or another, failed. They failed to pass down what they had to the next generation. I refuse. I refuse to let the apostolic faith be just a story that I hand to my children. It's going to be an experience that they have right here in this church. I refuse my children to hear that years ago eyes of the blind were open and deaf ears were unstopped and lame began to leap. I refuse to allow that to be a story that was passed down from the elders but I've got a, I've got a responsibility in this generation to with passion grab a hold of what the elders had and bring an anointing into this generation where my children not only hear the stories of a move of God but they experience for themselves they for themselves say, I remember the night somebody came into the door in a wheelchair and we had such a move of God that they got up out of that chair. We've got to contend for this faith. Because if you don't fight for it, it'll die. It'll go away. We don't fight for the things that are defined who we are. They will be lost. We cannot. We cannot lose our passionate, spirit-filled, apostolic prayer. We can't begin to pray like the denominal church. We're not going to be able to make it on now I lay me down to sleep prayer. We're not going to be able to make it on prayers to where you go into your prayer closet and you do your time and make yourself feel good but you've never broke through to the Holy Ghost. You've never made any difference in the Spirit. We've got to make sure that we contend and fight for the type of prayer that the apostolic church has been known for. It's not a time to get quiet now, church. We've been loud all this time. It's time to stay loud. It's time to let hell hear our voice and heaven know that we're still on this earth uh, contending, fighting and wrestling. Uh, We cannot revert back into a corner and be silent now but we've got to pray prayers uh, that is filled with passion uh, and filled with the Holy Ghost. We've got to continue praying the type of prayers that's gotten us where we are. We got to pray Acts 4.31 prayers. The Bible says, and when they had prayed, the house was shaken where they were assembled together. That's not just going to come easy. That type of prayer don't just happen. See, that's why a lot of people are losing it because it's, it's not easy. It's, it's, it takes time. It takes effort. It, it causes you to be attached to a burden. You have to, you have to have a burden to have that kind of prayer. You have to care about what's really going to happen. It's easy. It's easy to come into the house of God on a Sunday morning and ride on somebody else's prayer. But when was the last time that you felt like I've got to make sure that I pray through 
because my prayer is going to make a difference in this service. When's the last time that you came into the house of God with your mind made up, I've got to get in the Holy Ghost because I've got to be able to bring something into the house of God that changes the atmosphere of the service. See, your prayer changes the atmosphere of this service. And every person that commits themselves to being a part of that only makes the flow of the Spirit become more liberal and more powerful. If you don't come into the house of God with purpose, then you don't have any purpose. If you don't have any vision, then the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. When you lose your vision, when you lose your purpose, what you are and what you're supposed to be, you begin to die. You have a purpose every time that you come in the doors. And that purpose is not just to fill up a space on a pew. That purpose is not just to come to hear a pastor preach. That purpose is to come and be a contributor to the Spirit of God that wants to move in this house and to create an atmosphere where God can be sovereign and come and have a relationship with God. And you can't have a relationship with someone that you don't talk to. But we cannot allow our prayers to be dead and lifeless. Our prayers are passionate. Apostolic prayers have feelings and emotions and burdens attached to them. They're more than a ritual, but our prayer is a way of life. Our prayers are the foundation and strength and part of what keeps us going in the storms of life. Our prayers are powerful and effective. Apostolic prayer moves heaven and earth. And we've got to fight to keep it that way. We've got to fight to make sure that we maintain spirit-filled and emotionally charged worship. There's no other church or denomination out there that has the same type of worship than the apostolic church. And it's not time for us to change now. For years they've called us for they've called us holy rollers. We need to be exactly what they accuse us of. For years they've called us aisle runners. We need to be exactly what they've accused us of. They've called us crazy. It's no time to be sane now. Hallelujah. We're too close to the coming of the Lord. If there's any time that we need to be rowdy and radical, this is the hour. If there's any time that our worship needs to be crazier than it's ever been, this is the hour. If there's ever been an hour when we need to run the aisles, this is the hour. If there's ever been an hour when we need to dance before God, this is the hour. It's not time to back up now. It's not time to change it now. It's not time to dilute it and water it down now. We got to contend for our apostolic worship and make sure it's still apostolic. Our worship has hand clapping. Our worship has foot stomping. Our worship has tongue talking. Our worship has crying. Our worship has shouting. There might be some tears, but whatever it is, it's got to be spirit-filled worship. We can't settle for anything less now. I'm talking about contending for the faith. I'm talking about fighting for those things that the elders. When you come into the church, you didn't come into a dead church. And honey, I refuse to pastor a dead one in this generation. We're not going to be anything less than what the elders had. We're not going to be quiet now. We're not going to be still now. You can't find me one place in the Bible where worship was quiet or still. There's no place in the Bible where Jesus was ever worshipped with a moment of silence. You have a moment of silence when you're mourning something. We're not mourning anything because our God's not dead. He's alive. We're celebrating every time we come into the house of God. (laughs) 
This is not an hour to back off of our apostolic doctrine now. It bothers me when I preach doctrine and nobody worships like, oh, I've heard that a hundred times. It should mean more to you today than it did the day that you received it. Let me tell you something. It does matter today that if you, if you believe that Jesus is the, old, the Jehovah of the Old Testament manifested in the flesh uh, or if you believe he's the second in the Trinity. I'm here to tell you he's not the second in the Godhead. The Bible says the Godhead is in him. He is the fullness of the Godhead uh, in the flesh. Uh, it matters uh, whether or not you believe he's that. Uh, the Bible says Jesus said if you believe not uh, that I am he, uh, you will die in your soul sins. It matters if you believe there's one God or if there's three gods. It makes all the difference in the world. It matters if you believe Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It matters if you believe Ephesians 4 and 5. There's one Lord. There's one faith and there's one baptism. It matters if you believe that Jesus Christ is that one God this morning. I'm not watering it down for anybody now. My elders didn't water it down for me and I'm not watering it. It's not mine to water down. It's not my word. I didn't write it. It's God's. It makes a difference to Him who you believe He is. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father full of trace faith and truth. 2 Timothy 3 16 without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. For God, not the second person in the Godhead, but God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up in the glory. It matters today if you believe there's one God or not. And if we don't fight for it and if we don't teach it to our children, they won't know if there's one, two, or three. I'm talking about fighting for the faith. I'm talking about passing it down to the next generation so that they don't arise a generation that don't know what you know. It matters what mode of salvation you believe in this morning. Because there's only one. Only one way to heaven. Except the man be born of the water and the spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's plain. That's simple. Brother Irby, am I saved? Have you been born of the water and the spirit? If the answer is no, then you're not saved. I care what you believe. Well, I believe on the Lord. Good. That's a good start. But if you haven't experienced God's plan of salvation of being born of the water and the Spirit, if you haven't repented according to Acts 2.38 and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you are not ready for heaven. Not any time to back down from that. Because if you tell somebody any other thing, you're, you're damning them to hell. And possibly your own soul too. There's still one way. You can't make it any other way. We can't lose our passion about it. We can't lose that. I'm going to tell you, you just might as well get ready. Around here, you're going to hear the oneness of God on a regular basis. <laughs> You're going to hear Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved on a regular basis. You're going to hear repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost on a regular basis because it's the way to get to heaven. And I want you to know about it. And if you already know about it, then whoever walks through these doors, I want them to know about it. And I want my children to know about it. And should the Lord tarry, I want my grandchildren to know about it. I refuse to be guilty of not passing down to the next generation what I receive. Yes, 
Another thing that we've got to contend for is our holiness lifestyle. We ain't backing up now. The same thing that got us to where we are today is the same thing's going to carry us on to where we're going. Say, Brother Irby, you really going to teach holiness this morning? You better believe I am. Why? Because the Word of God says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's the Bible. I can't back up from it. I can't. I can't tell you anything different than what the Word of God says because I will stand before God. It's not time to back up. Our holiness is the identifying mark to who we are. Folks, I came out of the world. I'm not interested in blending in with it now. Do you think 26 years later I'm fixing to go back to what I came from? The children of Israel when they came out of Egypt did not look like an Egyptian. Part of the wilderness was to get Egypt out of them. It's one thing for God to get Israel out of Egypt, but it was the other thing to get Egypt out of Israel. And God didn't call the church out of the world for us to come in here and receive salvation and then revert back to the world. That's insanity. I don't want to look like the world. I don't want to act like the world. I don't want to dress like the world. I don't want to live like the world. I don't want to pray like the world. Why? Because I'm not of the world. I've been bought with a price. My body and my spirit belong to God and I'm going to glorify God in my body and my spirit which belong to Him. Say, well, Brother Irby, does it matter what we look like? Well, let me just give you an illustration, a very good illustration. We was at Parchment Penitentiary about three or four years ago, and we'd had just a powerful move of God. As a matter of fact, one gentleman had gotten out of the wheelchair. Another gentleman had been healed from a brain injury where he couldn't speak anymore, and he was now talking. And so Parchment was turned upside down. Parchment uh, Crusade is a Friday and a Saturday. All that happened on Friday night. Well, on Saturday... One of the ladies that was a part of the crusade shows up at the front gate of Parchman Penitentiary, a maximum prison sec- security prison. She didn't have her driver's license with her. She didn't have her crusade badge with her. As a matter of fact, she had no form of identification with her whatsoever. The front gate called out to the chaplain's office and began to explain the situation and listen to what the Assembly of God chaplain had to say. If she looks like the rest of the women that's in here, let her in. Because they've turned this place upside down. Her identity was her holiness look. This world needs to be able to look at us and tell we're not, we're not like them. They need to be able to hear our conversation and tell we're not like them. We don't need to be using words that they use that's not pleasing unto God. Not only do we not need to be using profanity, but we don't need to be using a whole lot of slang words that sound like things that they would say. You know, Pentecostal cuss words. I didn't say the real word. I just said this one. Same spirit behind it. Oh, I'm helping us this morning. Because there's some things that we're not going to lose. And we are not going to lose our holiness lifestyle. This is no time. It takes holiness to get to heaven. Come on. And holiness is more than just what you believe in your heart. Holiness is everything that you are. It's the way you dress. It's the way you look. It's the way you act. It's the way you fix your hair. It's the hairstyle that you carry. It's everything about you. And we're not backing up from it now. We're gonna be, this is gonna be a holiness church the day that Jesus Christ comes to get his bride. Oh, it's no time to get quiet on me now this morning. Somebody needs to help me preach this morning. Because if you don't teach holiness, the only other path is worldliness.
And the Bible says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. For if you love the world. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, okay? This ain't, this ain't my doctrine. This is what I had to swallow and digest when I came into this thing. He said, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. We're the bride of Christ. Now, I know that we're living in a generation that's confused because we're living in a generation that has these open relationships to where we can be married together and you can go corrals and I can go corrals, but that ain't Bible. And Jesus is not going to let His bride corrals around. He's not looking for a girlfriend. He's looking for a bride. He's looking for somebody that loves him enough to be committed to him that they're not out flirting with the things of the world. And if you're out flirting with the things of the world, he's not going to bring you into the bride. I'm just helping you this morning. We're not backing up for holiness. We're going to live it. We're going to believe it. We're going to teach it. And let me tell you this. You can have truth and not love truth. That's what's wrong with a lot of people. They have the truth. They know the truth. But they don't love the truth. And if you don't love the truth, then you'll be like Esau. You'll sell it cheap. You'll sell it. And you'll sell it cheap. If we're going to be contenders, that means that there are some opponents that we must defeat to be a contender. You see, in the boxing world, you have the world heavyweight champion and then you have people that are contenders for the championship. What that means is, is they have trained themselves and disciplined themselves. See, there's a lot of people that are boxers but not everybody's a contender the bible says that we are to earnestly contend for the faith we're going to become contenders i i, I saw i saw a, a deal the other day that i thought was pretty sharp it says fight like you're the third monkey going to the ark now maybe some of you ain't getting what that is but um there was only two monkeys that were allowed on the ark, one male and one female. And so it says, fight like you're the third monkey on the ark trying to get on there. There's got to be something in you. There's got to be some, I'm going to tell you, there's got to be some fight in you if you're going to make it to heaven. And it can't just be a little, hmm. you know, there's a lot of people that are called boxers, but they'll never be contenders. Why? One, because they don't have the passion to be a contender. They don't have the vision to be a contender. They don't have the desire to be a contender. And then there's a lot of them that don't have a discipline to be a contender. Because if you're going to be the heavyweight champion of the world in the boxing world, you've got to eat, sleep, and breathe becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. That's what you think about when you get up in the morning. That's what you do when you're doing your thing all through the day. That's what you're thinking about when you lay your head on the pillow at night is I'm going to be the world heavyweight champion. And what you have to do before you become a heavyweight champion is you have to fight your way up the ranks to become a top ten contender. And you got to work your... So there's some opponents. First of all, you got to have a desire for it. If you don't have the old brother Oggs preach the message, you got to have a want to. The only way you're going to make it to heaven is to have a want to. The only way that you're going to be a genuine apostolic is there's got to be, you, you, can't, you can't be divided on whether or not, well, do I want to be a full-fledged apostolic or do I want to just pansy around in the world? Do I want to be all the way in the church or, or do I want to be one of those that walk so close to the edge uh, that if somebody bumps me a little bit, I'm going to fall. You, you just got to come into this thing with all that you got and say, I'm not interested uh, in being anything but everything I can be for God. 
You got to make up your mind because the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. If you ain't got your mind made up that heaven is all you're interested in and the church is all you're interested in being in, you are not going to make it. I'm just helping you this morning. And so if you're going to be a contender, you got, you got to fight your way into being a contender. And if we're going to be contenders of the faith, there's some things, there's some opponents that we have to defeat to become a tender. We, we've got to defeat a casual, laid-back approach to the kingdom of God. There ain't nothing casual about this, folks. There's not no halfway in this. It's either all or Nothing. There's no casual about it. There's no half-hearted. What did Jesus say the great commandment was? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. We've got to defeat a, a casual laid-back spirit. Let me tell you this. It's easy to be carnal. You know what you have to do to be carnal? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because you know what the word carnal means? Natural. It's natural for you to be carnal. It's easy. But it takes some fight to be spiritual. Why? Why? Because you've got to fight against your natural carnal nature to become spiritual. There's got to be something in your mind that says, I refuse to be a dead, dried up, plucked up on the pew, used to be apostolic. I, I refuse. The first four years that I, I, I began to have an experience with God, I was in this, I was in this little old church. As Jerry Clower would say, it was graveyard dead. If they had tongues and interpretation every six months, they thought they were in revival. And the only reason I went there is because the only ride that I had to any church was with a family member. But I told God, I said, God, the day that you provide me with the ride, I will never ever ever, ever go to another dead church. And believe you me, the day I got a ride. See ya. And I began hunting for a church where the fire is. Do you know what people are hunting for today? Do you know what people are... Let me help you with some lies that are in Pentecost today, okay? Well, I'm not sure they want what we got. Why do you think they showed up at your church? If they weren't looking for what you got, why didn't they go somewhere else? And so you know what? When they come through the doors of an apostolic Pentecostal supposed to be spirit-filled church, and there's nothing going on, They're upset. You know, this is something I never understood. Now, I wasn't raised in church, so you'll excuse me, but um, scenes at bars are not dead. A dead bar is an empty bar, okay? So let me help you. Why in the world would people think that folks are going to come out of a lively bar into a dead church? Just trying to help us today. Now we're not fixing to get this. Don't get up. Don't get worried, elders. We're not fixing to get. We're not fixing to get a fog machine, and we're not fixing to get disco lights. But we are going to have a lively atmosphere around here. We are going to have music that's going to have life to it. 
We are going to clap our hands. We're going to stomp our feet. We're going to dance. We're going to worship when they come through the doors of the first United Pentecostal Church of Brandon. What they're going to find here is a Pentecostal church. They're going to find a church that's in love with God. They're going to find a church that wants to worship God. They're going to find a church that's praying for a lost generation with passion. And they're going to find a church that's having a move of the Holy Ghost. And it might scare them to death the first time that they come. But I can assure you if we're having a move of the Holy Ghost, uh, there'll be something that grab a hold of their heart and their spirit. They might run from it for a week or two. But then something will click in them and say, hey, they got something I ain't felt anywhere else. I think I'll go back and see what it is. If we're going to continue to contend for this faith, and be contenders, we have to defeat the spirit of worldliness. Because you know what? It'll kill a move of God quicker than anything else. Sin and worldliness. You won't have a move of God with sin and worldliness. If you're entertaining your flesh all week long with the things of the world, I'm talking about sinful things. I'm talking about things that are contrary to the word of God. I'm talking about things that aren't feeding your spirit. Then. You won't come into the house of God on Sunday morning and have a move of God. Let me, let me just ask you this. How many of you, if you knew you were fishing to meet the Queen of England, notice I didn't say the President, but the Queen of England, you were going to meet her on a Sunday morning. You'd start preparing it. and You are going to meet her at 10. You'd start preparing for that meeting at, at 9.30 Sunday morning. Anybody? Of course you would. What you would do is on Saturday. On Saturday, you would go to the shopping mall. And you would find the best dress that you could find if you were a lady. And if you were the guy, you would find the nicest suit that you could find. And if you needed a haircut, if you was a guy and you needed a haircut, you would make your way to the barber shop on Saturday to make sure you're cut all clean and nice. And you would make sure everything is just exactly the way it needs to be. You would make sure everything about you matches. You would make sure that you were dressed appropriately. That your attitude and your spirit was what it needed to be to meet the Queen of England. Let me help you. On Sunday morning, somebody much greater than the Queen of England shows up in this house. But you know what? If we're not careful, we'll start getting ready for a meeting with him at 9.30 Sunday morning. Something to think about, ain't it? I promise you, I don't get, start getting ready for Sunday, Sunday morning. I get excited. Wednesday night, after church is over, I'm already thinking Sunday's coming. And God's going to be there. And you know what? I look out across the congregation and it is very apparent that, that you dressed yourself ready to come to church because you look nice today. But did you know that there's more to getting ready for the house of God than your this? How much effort then you put into your mind being ready to be here? How much effort did you put into your spirit being ready to be here this morning? You see, it's easy just to get up and get our body ready. But you've got to contend to get that spirit and mind ready. Say, Brother Irby, what are you talking about? I'm talking about when I roll out of bed on Sunday morning, I just go ahead and click Pandora on and find one of my favorite stations and I begin to listen to some good old gospel music to get my mind and my spirit ready. And I begin to pray, God, talk, me, talk to me today. Use me today. Let me be a vessel today. God, I, I, I want you to bless me today, but God, I want to be a blessing too. 
You see, it's a world of difference between coming into the house of God and being a recipient of somebody else's overflow. Folks, we need to quit settling for crumbs. We're not the Syrophoenician woman. But even she wouldn't settle for nothing. Jesus said, it's not meat for me to give the children's bread to dogs. She said, yea, Lord. But even dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. But you know what? Many times if we're not careful because we haven't prepared ourselves to come into the house of God, because we haven't fought our carnal nature and, and pressed our way into the spirit, what we do is we come in here and we eat the crumbs that's fallen from somebody else that's made themselves ready. Somebody else that has prayed fasted and sought the face of God that cannot be we have to, fit to defeat the spirit of carnality and then lastly we have to defeat a spirit that says it doesn't matter there's a spirit that says it doesn't matter if you pray or if you don't pray it doesn't matter if you fast or if you don't fast it doesn't matter if you Feed your mind worldly things all week long. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you believe in one God or three. It doesn't matter if you're baptized in the titles or in Jesus' name. It doesn't matter if you get the Holy Ghost or if you're done. And it doesn't matter if you speak in tongues or if you don't speak in tongues. That's the spirit that's in this world. Then there's another spirit that says, well, it don't take all that. It don't take all of that Holy Ghost and it doesn't take all of that holiness and it doesn't take all of that separation. But it takes every bit of it. Why? Because this book says so. So if it's somebody else's word against his, I think I'll take his. Mm. Every time. I don't know about you. But I'm going to be a contender for the faith. Not just the doctrine, but the whole faith. <clears throat> We've had some wonderful miracles in this church. And quite a few in the last two years. On several occasions, we've, we've had cancer dried up. We've seen backs healed. We've seen headaches healed. We've seen people come from the verge of death to have quite a bit of life. That don't just happen. It only happens when somebody says, I refuse to be a used to be. I refuse for the apostolic faith just to be nothing more than history. I refuse. And I'm glad today that I believe I'm pastoring a church as we all stand together. I believe with all of my heart that I'm pastoring a church this morning that has a desire to not only hear about what the elders experienced in days gone by, but you have a desire to contend and fight to experience for yourself. Sister Madison's one of our new babies. I'm glad this morning that her experience of the apostolic church isn't just stories of, well, we used to have a move of the Holy Ghost. We used to shout. We used to have miracles. We used to pray and God answered. I'm glad that's not her experience. I'm glad this morning that since she's been born into this apostolic faith, she's seen for herself the mighty hand of God. 
But that won't continue unless we fight for this. We've got to fight for prayer. We've got to fight for worship. We've got to fight for our doctrine. We've got to fight for our holiness. We've got to contend against worldliness and carnality. Allow the Spirit of God to remain alive and well in our life. We've got to feed our spirit so that we have faith to operate in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. If you're here this morning and you've never operated in one of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, do you know that the Bible tells us to desire spiritual gifts and to seek after them? I challenge you this morning, if you've never operated in one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, I challenge you to begin to pray and ask God to use you because God wants every person in this house to be a vessel of the Holy Ghost the Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe it didn't say these signs shall follow the pastor or the preacher these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall speak with new tongues they shall cast out devils I'm talking about believers they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive power in your life. Question is, what are you going to do with that power? Is it going to be like seeds that are laid up in a dry soil and just lay there dormant? Or are you going to stir it and activate it and allow it to work through you this morning. I'm going to be a contender. I'm going to fight for the faith. I'm going to make sure that I do everything that I can to ensure that my children have no excuse not to live for God. Not to see the power of God. Unfortunately, we can't control what our adult children do and don't do. But we sure can make a difference and influence it. We sure can take away every excuse to where it's all down to what they choose. But I want to make sure that my children say, well, Daddy, I never saw that and I never felt that. And I... Amen. I'm opening the altars this morning to somebody that might want to contend just for a moment. Somebody that might want to come and say, God, I want to renew my passion and desire for the things of the kingdom today. I want to renew my burden and my vision for the things of the kingdom today. I want to make sure that I discipline my life in such a way that I fight and contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I want to make sure that when I stand before you beside the elders of old, that I'll be able to say, I walk the same path that you walked, elder. I preach the same thing that you preached. I believe the same thing that you believed. I want to make sure that when I stand before God, what I have in my hand is not anything less than what was delivered to me. I want to make sure that it's everything that was delivered and even more.